Good morning. This is the Innovation Conversation. I'm Kevin Koop. And I'm Tom Furphy. So Tom, yesterday, and Amazon finally, after many, many months uh, and, and even more months of promising, finally opened their Amazon Fresh grocery store, the first one in Woodland Hills, California. We had some videos, some pictures on Morning Newsbeat. Uh, it got a lot of publicity. Uh, what'd you think? You know, I'd say it, it uh, I thought in the pictures, I think it looks really nice. Um, I think you had commented um, in today's, I guess yesterday, as people watch this um, column that, you know, it's hard to get a sense from the photos, particularly the pre-launch photos, um, you know, if it'll be kind of a sterile environment. Now, I guess nowadays you want a somewhat sterile environment, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, will it be an enriched, immersive, you know, retail environment that's warm and has the sights and smells and all that? I think, you know, that is still to be determined. It looks like it has a good chance to, um, but I think, you know, I mean, initially, they did they 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 never promised that they were going to come out with something that was like revolutionary and was going to change the way you think about a grocery store right i think the promise was that that they were going to come out with something that was going to deliver a really good grocery experience within the portfolio of things that they deliver for their customers and looking at what they're starting with you know it seems like they're delivering on it yeah yeah i think from the from the beginning and in this case i i was completely wrong in terms of what i thought they would do versus what they did i kept thinking they were they should they would or should re, totally um revolutionize the grocery experience because you're amazon and why not and right. um then what's the point of just delivering another grocery store um i think when i was looking at the pictures in the video uh I guess my I had a little bit of a concern that maybe it was a little bit too much like the uh, 365 by Whole Foods stores. It had a bit of that feel to it, but it, that but it's really hard to tell. Um, not not being there. Yeah, I can see I can see that uh, that it looked somewhat like that, and it's a little bit hard to tell. Um, I mean, Amazon is going to keep innovating, right? And yeah, there's been a bunch of things in the past where they've made a big leap. Um, you know, and taken customers over that chasm, you know, to the other side. I don't know that folks are quite ready for that in grocery yet. You know, I think that if you build a, you know, a, a compelling store environment with the elements of, I mean, they don't have much of this yet. They do have pickup and delivery from the store and they have the whole pickup area kind of designed, you know, within the flow of the store, which is purpose built for that, which puts them way ahead of any other retailer that's already there. Um, you know, but I think as you see them offering more automation, they'll be able to evolve that customer experience, I think, in ways that are not necessarily massive leaps for customers, but can move the customer forward. Um, it's hard to have a big, bold, physical grocery strategy based on a significant departure uh, from where we've been, but I can assure uh, everyone, uh, as we all know, they're going to keep innovating and keep, you know, keep advancing that experience. Well, and I'm perfectly willing to cop to the the notion that when I that my expectations are are framed by the fact that I don't actually have to do it, and in fact have never done it, <laughs> and so <laughs> right. um, and so I, I get that. Um, uh, you know, there, there is an advantage sometimes of only being a pundit, but nobody else. They don't have to live up to my expectations at all. One of the things that was interesting, you make me think in terms of what you just said, it is, it is interesting to me that they are, that they have done, if we're gonna think of fulfillment, as opposed to shopping, right? If you think of them as being a fulfillment machine, that they've come at it from so many different angles and tried so many different things. They had the dash one, they had the dash buttons, they've got subscribe and save. Um, Prime is its own kind of fulfillment mechanism. And I don't think we know yet how Prime fits into this store. Um, and that'll be interesting to find out. Um, now they've got these dash carts. They've got, you know, uh, through Whole Foods, they've got Prime Now. They've got all these different level layers of it that they try in different kinds of ways. And that's sort of interesting that, that, that you know, it's not like they have, they only have one way to come right. to when they think about fulfillment, they're clearly thinking about that concept in a very, you know, it's kind of sophisticated and nuanced way and willing to try lots of different things. And by the way, when something either doesn't work or they've moved past it, like the, 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 uh, the dash buttons, okay, well, fine, we'll move on. And that's, and that's what they do better than almost anybody else. Well, it's all about reducing friction in the process, right? And 
one of the biggest friction points in e-commerce in general is getting the stuff, right? It's, it's getting the stuff quickly and, you know, and now the standard is for free, right? So I want it fast and free. And Amazon keeps, you know, in traditional e-commerce keeps pushing fast and free. And then as they look at the grocery experience, you know, they think about things like, yeah, in replenishment, right? Put it on uh, subscribe and save or use some of the other auto replenishment features that they have. And dash, the dash buttons were a part of that, right? The dash buttons were really meant for a couple things. One, you were able to engage a brand at the point of use and point of purchase, right? So I'm at the washing machine, putting my laundry detergent, I'm not gonna go with a brand here, uh, putting my laundry detergent uh, into, the, into the washer and I'm able to press that button when it, when it runs out. And then when I run out of dryer sheets, boom, I can press that. And you know, that just teaches the shopper that this stuff can become, um, you know, kind of can, can kind of happen in the background. And you know, I think you're, gonna, you're seeing now in the store environment, um, you know, the types of friction that get in the way of traditional shopping they're working to remove. Right, you don't need to spend a lot of time walking up and down aisles in the store because you can pre-order a lot of the stuff and have it, you know, assembled for you to pick up. You can still then also decide to come in and get fresh product. Um, so, you know, they're 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 working to evolve the process, and I think really meaningful ways. Well, and based on what you just said, not just working to evolve the process, but also working to evolve the customer. And Absolutely, it raises the bar. So you started you started that by talking about the fact that cust customers aren't maybe ready for. Go, Amazon Go at the scale of a grocery store yet. But this is all part of an educational continuum, right? That they just keep, they just keep working it and wearing yeah. it down. And, and at some point, I would guess that dash carts will become redundant because the people say, well, that's, that's actually, we don't think of it as being friction now, but at some point the, those dash carts will become friction and they'll go away and they'll, and they'll, something else will, will take their place. It's all about, you know, it's, 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 it's continually improving the value that they deliver to their customers and they do that predominantly through Prime and what Prime means, right? So being Prime and the things you do within the Prime program, you know, that's their kind of marketing platform to you. That's how they get access to you as a customer. That's where you do, where you perform lots of activities and ultimately share a lot of information back with Amazon. And Amazon sees that they, 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 they take that with great responsibility and they want to provide back to you as the customer more and more value for that. I mean, Jeff Be Bezos said years ago, you know, I want it to be irresponsible, to be seen as irresponsible to not be a prime member. Um, and, you know, they're just gonna keep, keep adding to that, um, adding to that value. So to your, to your point earlier, I think it's gonna be really uh, interesting to see how they deliver benefit to prime customers in these stores. We we, now, I, mean, I think it's been clearly established. Um, I mean, you were the guy who led the team that's created subscribe and save automatic replenishment at Amazon. I'm clearly a, a big proponent of automatic replenishment, talk about it all the time. Would you be surprised if there were not a subscribe and save component some built into the store somewhere? Yeah, I think that they will build it in. You know, Amazon has such a powerful program now through the um, through the subscribe and save program. And then, you know, the related, like, you know, contiguous to that is Dash, because they have Dash reorder, there's Alexa reorder. So there's other auto replenishment programs that are connected to the dot-com platform, which is the packaged goods business. So call it your pantry or your medicine cabinet, right? Or your cleaning cupboard. Um, they have such a big business and a well-established and fast growing business there. I mean, that business alone, is over 2% of CPG volume in the US. I mean, it's a, it's a massive, massive uh, program. So, you know, I think that those programs will, will continue because they're good. You know, if, if you don't have to go to the store at all to pick up stuff and it can be, you know, sent to your door and Amazon has a great delivery system for that, that's pretty convenient. I do think though that they will extend some level of auto replenishment to these stores um, and that, you know, you can, particularly because these stores are serving, you know, traditional retail pack sizes, right? Subscribe and save on Amazon, you tend to have to, you know, subscribe to bigger packs that may not be convenient. Um, at the store level, you could, you could subscribe or replenish, um, you know, 
products that you know would be kind of normal for your grocery tip. So I think you'll start to see more of that. But I also think, and, and there's a lot of retailers doing this now, um, this, is a, this is a really big opportunity. Retailers should see what Amazon's doing with this store and they should think a couple of things. One, all right, the store experience, it's fine, it's good. I'm not that, I'm like right there or ahead or not far behind with my store experience, right? So existing retailers kind of got that in a pretty good spot. What you can't see is under the covers what Amazon's doing with the data, right? And how they are engaging their customers, how they're making their life easier, you know, things like replenishment, things like just the way they market to, the, to, to folks and how they make it easy to, you know, either deliver or pick up or shop in store. That's where, you know, incumbent retailers really need to, really need to make advances. And I think the best ones certainly are working on that. Retailers have to, don't know what Amazon is doing with the data, but we can be assured that they are doing something with the data. Absolutely. <laughs> um, one of the things I thought was really impressive about the video was when they showed uh, what seems to be a, a, a fairly good sized department for pickup. And then that was a big counter with a lot of bags. And I thought that was interesting. There was a story that came out a couple of weeks ago, I had it on Morning Newsbeat, um, can't measure, I can't remember where it appeared originally, talking about how Whole Foods actually had problems during the pandemic because they were not built uh, for things like pickup. And uh, I know, I mean, and Bert Flickinger, I remember made a comment about, yeah, they really got caught and they, they just did not have that infrastructure built. And, and I could even see that at my Whole Foods store, right? Where right. they, you know, the, the, where they were doing the, the Prime Now pickup was at the other end of the store. I mean, it just wasn't built right for it. But clearly this is, this is at, built exactly for it. They must have, you know, figured out again where to take out all the friction. Absolutely. Yeah, clearly it was. I mean, and, you know, they also have the capital, um, you know, to be able to go out and build dozens or hundreds of these stores. And we know based on how fast they can deploy assets, I mean, watch how quick they can hire people, how quick they can open fulfillment centers. Once they get the template down for the store, they're going to be able to blow that out uh, pretty good. Incumbent retailers don't quite have that luxury, but, you know, they do have control over their space and they can start rethinking their existing space, I think, uh, in new ways to serve this kind of model. Well, let's talk about rollout. I and mean, when you think about it, this is a 35,000 square foot store, it's probably fair to, to say, you know, the format could probably go as low as, uh, without having seen it, it, right. it probably could go as low as 25 and probably could go as big as, you know, 50 or 55, depending on the location, maybe bigger than that. Um, you know, it seems to me there's an awful lot of real estate out there right now. If you're looking for a 35 to 40,000 square foot box, I'll bet you. I'll bet you there's hundreds of them around this country where landlords would be very willing to play let's make a deal simply because that, and they got nobody else going in. Yeah, I think that that's probably true. It's a, you know, it's a challenging time uh, uh, in traditional kind of brick and mortar retail real estate. But, uh, you know, any of those, any of those, you know, kind of good locations and whatnot, you know, they'll, I think rents will hold up pretty reasonable in those, but, you know, um, I am sure Amazon is out, uh, you know, uh, you know, spanning the market uh, for opportunities. Right. Looking, for, looking for space. Yeah. Um, so I thought the the um, the other one other interesting thing I thought was that they're apparently going to have a pretty aggressive private label program. That was one of the things that came out that which I thought was interesting. They're reinventing their pri a private label food program. Um, I thought that was interesting. I thought um, the wine program particularly was interesting. Cursive. Yeah. I don't know anything about it. Uh, they seem to have kept that pretty well under wraps. I'm not sure who they're working with. Uh, and then I'm sure we can ultimately find or figure that out uh, in the near term. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty neat to think that they're opening, you know, already with a position in, in, in corporate brands and private label. And what a great name for a brand built, being built by a company that depends on keyboarding. Right. Right. right? I mean, you can't, you can't say that Jeff Bezos doesn't have a sense of humor and a sense of irony. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It's a good, it's a, I think it's a good label for wine. It's a, it's a cool name. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, listen, I, I mean, I, I, I still think that, you know, if you're a, a specialty retailer, you know, like a, like a Dorothy Lane market or in, in Seattle, in, in Met Market or Bristol Farms, any oh, yeah. of those kinds of retailers, they don't have, I mean, they'll pay attention, but they don't have to worry about these guys too much because it's, they're just in a different business. 
And if you're Winco, I don't think you have, you know, you've got such a strong pro value price proposition that, again, you're going to pay attention, but you don't have to worry. It's that it's all those retailers in the middle who don't have a differentiated um, value proposition and a differentiated offering. It seems to me that this is, this is aimed at them and, and stealing market share from them. Yeah. And it may not seem as threatening now when, you know, there's a few locations in Southern California, there's a few locations coming in Chicago, but you can pretty much bet that when they get this formula figured out, as I said earlier, there's going to be dozens to hundreds of these. So they're going to be in the backyard of most everybody that's watching this. And they're going to, you know, you're going to need to, you need to figure out where you can differentiate. And I do, I think a lot of those more culinary uh, retailers, you know, will still, farewell uh against them uh i think yeah if you're in the muddled middle it's gonna be tough you know if you rely on foot traffic to come in and make your profit off of mediocre you know perimeter and and vendor dollars and 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 package goods uh that model is not gonna not gonna fare really well over the next decade so last question though so i mean there and i don't know the, what amazon ever said about it they probably never said this but there were a lot of expectations that there could be um, many more Amazon bookstores than that, that have been built to this point. And God knows everybody thought that there'd be a lot more Amazon Go stores that have been built to this point. Sure. Now, that may be expectations from consumers and analysts and, you know, idiot pundits like me. Um, but, but the expectations there would be a lot more. Would you guess that the likelihood of there being a lot more of Amazon, a lot more Amazon grocery stores than uh, is higher than for Amazon bookstores or Amazon ghost stores? Well, Amazon bookstores, first of all, the books market is minuscule compared to the food and CPG grocery market, right? That's, right. I mean, it is like a, a fifth, no, not a fifth. It's like, it's like 5% of the size, you know, three to 5% of the size It's very small. So there's not as much in it for Amazon. To right. Stores. Um, uh, the other, um, and then go, you know, I don't know. I mean, go, I still think go is a pretty interesting concept. I, I, my bet is they'll do a bunch more of those. Um, but I also think, you know, right now with, where we're at with pandemic and whatnot and where's population gonna 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 settle out and you know where will the good locations be will city locations be the same you know i think that there's other things to focus on right now but i know that the learning they're getting from go has been i'm sure quite valuable so you know i would expect to see a bunch more of those you know will it be a thousand of them i don't know will there be a hundred of them probably i lied i have one more question okay Based on what you could see, and you have no inside information here, but based on what you could see, it, my assumption would be that the Amazon Fresh grocery store looks like a much less expensive proposition just to build out than an Amazon Go store. Because Amazon Go oh, is smaller, yeah. but tons of technology. This doesn't look like it would be nearly as expensive to build out. No, I mean, I think you, you look at the store as it, you know, as we can see in the pictures, right? It's a pretty typical 35,000 square foot grocery store as far as infrastructure costs and asset costs is what it looks like. Um, you probably have a little bit more, I mean, with Alexa wired in there and, you know, but that's not really gonna cost you anymore because all stores need really good Wi-Fi now, right? Just to serve their customers and then to serve the e-commerce operations. Um, so I think all that stuff is pretty much on par. Um, I would expect to see more automation in the future. Um, I would expect to see more micro fulfillment capability in these locations. And that'll add, you know, a couple million bucks in cost uh, per location. But overall, I think they're, they look to, I mean, they're, they're on a square foot, on a per foot basis, way, way less than go. And, and certainly it, they may put in all that more technology, which will cost them more money, but A, they have the money, and, right? And mm -hmm. B they will have a clear path to figuring out, you know, how to measure the return on that investment, which could be ample. It'll be thoughtful. Put, deploying it will be thoughtful and how they measure it will be thoughtful and then how they scale it will, will also be thoughtful. Anyway, well, listen, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Uh, that's this edition of the Innovation Conversation. I'm Kevin Koop. And I'm Tom Furby.
I will see you next time, everybody. Thank you.